Welcome back. Well, assassinations remain one of the shadier ways in which political and military leaders try to alter the balance of power. But does it work? Well, they are a high-risk affair, and on many occasions, assassinations have backfired on those who ordered them. On this plane in 1983 was Ninoy Aquino, a Filipino politician who thought he was returning home to safety. He was tipped to take control of his country, but minutes later, this was the scene. He was shot in the back of the head as he stepped from his plane. Millions attended his funeral, blaming President Marcos for his assassination. The killing thrust Ninoy's wife, Corazon, into the public eye. Three years later, a popular revolution put Corazon in control, driving Marcos out of the Philippines. President Kabila seemed like a saviour of the Democratic Republic of Congo in 1997. Adoring crowds saluted him wherever he went. But just a few years later, his bodyguard walked up and shot him three times as he sat in his armchair. We still don't know who was really responsible, but most say it was part of a failed military coup. Kabila's 30-year-old son, Joseph, took over within days and was recently re-elected as president. Well, joining us for more discussion are our guests again in Beirut, Alistair Crook, a former security adviser to the EU, and in London, Richard Belfield, an author and TV producer, has written extensively about political assassinations, and Zahir Jan Mohammed from Amnesty International is in Washington. If I could come to you, Mr. Belfield, um, can assassinations, I mean, we've seen that some of them can backfire, is that generally your view? Yes, I, th I can't think of a single instance where actually it's genuinely achieved what the plotters or the assassins wanted to. I mean, generally, I think the law of unintended consequences is what applies here, and that it's very, very difficult for anybody to actually uh, guess I exactly what it is that is going to ha is going to happen. As your examples show, in many instances, the outcome was exactly the opposite of what the assassins would have ch would have wanted. Um, Mr. Crook, if Israel do manage to assassinate Haniya or Michelle, what would the outcome be, do you think? Uh, it will radicalize the ground and new leaders will take their place. It, it's certainly been the experience before. I recall uh, earlier when Israel invaded Lebanon, first of all, uh, they faced an insurgency in the south of Lebanon and dealt with that by trying to assassinate some of the leaders. They were local leaders from the sheikhs, uh, from the mosques and others. And they succeeded. And as a result, they ended up with the Amal resistance group. They attacked some of their leaders. And what happened was they ended up with Hezbollah. So I think what you see is that actually it is very counterproductive. It makes people more radicalized. And you end up with harder line leaders. As I heard General Mohammed, presumably some of the governments that in get involved in this say that they want to protect you know, state security. Is there ever any kind of justification for this kind of action? Uh, no, I don't believe there ever is, because I think what happens with uh, executions by the state is that it's bypassing the judicial system. And I think what's important is for governments to instill faith and hope in the judicial system. And when the state chooses that, shows that it is above the law, that I can do as it wants, you know, it's hard then to, to, to develop credibility for the judicial system. Another component that I should add that, that hasn't been mentioned is that I think a lot of these executions are occurring because on, on the popular level, there's not a lot of um, people speaking out against state executions. I know here in the United States that I think the American public in many ways uh, for a variety of reasons has come to a point where they've, they've begun to condone executions by the state. And I think what's important is that at a popular le level, people speak up when the United States government and other governments do act in extrajudicial killings. And I don't see that happening now. I think there's been a gradual shift. People have been thinking that in the name of security, anything is acceptable. And that is a very distressing trend. Uh, Mr. Belfield, is that part of the problem that the so-called anti-terror laws have actually made it easier for governments to, on the face of it, justify what they're doing? Um, yes, but in, but I don't think they're actually doing anything now that they haven't done, or you know, for the last in all you know the last you know several hundred years. I mean, I looked at 1960, a very interesting year, when the five members of the United Nations Security Council and, the, and their five leaders, who which was Macmillan, Eisenhower, De Gaulle, Mao, and Khrushchev, five of the great names of the 20th century, and in that year, all five of them personally signed off on, on assassinations in different parts of the world. So I think actually there's a huge slice of hypocrisy here. When, uh, particularly when um, first world nations are starting to go around and condemning uh, assassination, because actually the reality is this has always been one of the tools uh, of, of trying to achieve political power. It's interesting that, if, as, as you were saying, if, if it does seem to be counterproductive, why do you think they carry on doing it? 
I think it's extremely contagious. And the problem is, as Alistair Crook pointed out, that once you start on this, um, this, tr this chain, and once you start uh, using assassination, then, then people use it back against you. And it just escalates out of control. And it escalates very quickly. Alistair Crook, how easy is it? I mean, it's, it would seem to sort of an average person that it would seem quite difficult for someone to turn up in another country and, and start killing people. But is it easy or, or, or difficult? How, what do you think? I think it's quite easy to do this if you're planned, you have, if you're organized and you have plans for it. But I think what was uh, striking about uh, the assassinations and the killings that are taking place now is, is the way in which they're dehumanized. Uh, they've been reduced almost to something like a computer game. You see it on the television screens. There's a crosshairs. A car moves into the crosshairs. And then there is a little splurge of color across your screens. And you're told that a deadly terrorist has gone. You never know if it was the right person that was killed or how many innocent people were also killed in that explosion. But it's turned it into something that is uh, dehumanized, that is, if you like, sanitized from the real suffering and the reality of what this type of killing involves. So, Heja Mohammed, how do you counter that kind of dehumanization and uh, that sort of pro process towards people not realizing quite what's going on? Well, I think there are two components of it. First of all, there has to be an acceptance that countries like Israel are, in fact, engaging in extrajudicial assassinations. I think that might be a given in other countries, but here in the United States, that isn't widely accepted. I mean, if you look at the State Department Human Rights Report on Israel, it does not mention these extrajudicial assassinations. So that's one. There has to be an acknowledgment. Second is, you know, as the previous speaker said, is that the manner in which these uh, assassinations are presented is as if they're very precise strikes. You know, the, the word they use is surgical strikes. And I think what has to be um, forwarded to the public is that many of these strikes are, in fact, imprecise, that there are civilian casualties, and that, you know, as other speakers have said, it is counter effective, that this, in fact, does lead to a higher climate of violence in which all parties suffer from this type of uh, assassinations. Mr. Belfield, how difficult is it, though, to if, if a state is involved in something like that, to, to hold them accountable and to, and to actually get some kind of justice for the person who has been killed? I think when it's the members of the United Nations Security Council who are doing it, it's virtually impossible. I mean, they're supposed to be the guardians of world safety and security. And if they are practicing this, what role model, you know, are they setting for the rest of the world? It seems to me that actually, you know, nations have got to stand up and be accountable, you know, and hold themselves accountable and set some proper standards of behavior. Is that likely to happen, Alistair Crook? No, certainly not. The West uh, claims that it has special rights because it's more advanced as it sees it and other nations are more backward, if you like, on the spectrum of modernity. It says that we are in a position to decide and to try and create the international order. So they assume global responsibilities for this order and the special rights and the exceptionalism to kill people, but it is still just a, n a new name for an old vice of murdering your political opponents. There's no judicial process and there's no real legitimacy or justice to it. A new name for an old vice, uh, Zahir Jan Mohammed. Ca how can you change that cycle of violence? Um, well, I think it's tricky. I think there has to be uh, a, a change in, in, in how we look at assassination. As he said, you know, this is something that's been occurring repeatedly, and I think there has to be international pressure on this. But I think what's happened is that the international community has shown to be almost impotent in this, in this circumstance, because those who are committing these assassinations will do as they want. And I think there has to be some sort of popular um, uh, uh, outcry against these sort of assassinations. And okay. I simply haven't seen that here in the United States. Zahir Jan Mohammed, uh, thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us from Washington. Thank you also uh, to our guests in Beirut, Alistair Crook, uh, who's a former security advisor to the EU, and in London, Richard Belfield, uh, an author who's written extensively about political assassinations. Well, thank you so much for joining us here on this edition of Inside Story. One final thought. While uh, politics can be a dangerous business, researchers in the United States examined assassination attempts on all world leaders from 1875 to 2004, and they found that three quarters of them had failed. And for politicians nowadays, they put the chance of death at the hands of an assassin at just 0.3%. So some interesting food for thought there. Well, we welcome your comments and suggestions. Please email them to us at InsideStory at aljazeera.net. That's InsideStory at aljazeera.net. Thank you very much for watching this edition. But from all the team, bye for now.